So it's streaming from there through AA. Where's Fran at? Is she in the building or is she at home? Gotcha. Oh, here's coming. Hey. We're live, so. Oh, can you hear me? Okay, so we're live. We don't. Okay. So you see how many work over Okay. So here it says we're live. So you're just going to have to keep an eye on that little screen. Howdy, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Aggie, Hort Aggie Horticulture Facebook Live. We're going to give it a couple minutes for everyone to sign on. Get yourself a glass of wine. It's wine o'clock time. So welcome to the Arthur and Gay Platt Fermentation Science Lab here on campus. We're wearing our safety guard here, so we apologize. Hopefully the sound is coming in nicely, even with our masks but we are on university property, so we're gonna be safe today. So for anyone, um, for everyone who's tuning in, go ahead and tell us where you're tuning in from. If you have grapevines in the backyard, tell us uh, what you're growing, if you've harvested them yet. I know um, some of our growers in the Gulf Coast have already harvested grapes like Blanc du Bois, maybe starting Black Spanish or some other hybrid. Um, I know our hobbyists and even commercial growers up north are getting ready to start harvesting grapes, depending on what they are. So let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, and if you're growing something, let us know. Uh, we're going to give it just a couple more minutes for everyone to get online here. Um, we have a full team of horticulture specialists on the chat. So if any of y'all are tuning in for the first time to our Aggie Horticulture Facebook Live series, you have the capability to ask questions through the chat box. And if we can't answer them live, our specialist will answer them through the chat box live. So we've got a great group who's going to be able to help us today. Michael, while we wait on the slow folks to tune in here, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about wine. So we're talking about home wine making today, which must mean it's legal for us to do. That's right. OK. Uh, but is there a limit? Can you make the stuff and give it away? Can you make the stuff and sell it? So we are dealing with alcohol, so of course there are regulations. Um, they're fairly lax though, so we know that uh, the average household of one adult can make 100 gallons of finished wine. If there are two adults in the household, up to 200 gallons. So how many bottles would that be? I was going to say, I don't drink wine by the gallon. That's right. <laughs> Nor do most people. but. Uh, a gallon makes five standard size bottles. Maybe in your college days, but not now. I'm in my college days. <laughs> We're at Texas A&M. So a standard size bottle of wine is three quarters of a liter, and that makes about four or five glasses. Do you yeah. know how big a serving of wine, a glass of wine is? Three ounces, is it? Yeah, about three to five ounces, depending on how you pour. Depending on how you pour, no matter the glass size, there are wine glasses that hold half a bottle. That's right. So that doesn't count for that recommendation of one glass of red wine a day for health. It's one three to five ounce serving, not a fish bowl. That's right. And Michael, if you can't drink seven glasses on Saturday night, don't worry. You're good for the week. That is 
moderate consumption. In moderation, that's right. So, all right, guys, I think we're going to get started here. We've given some time for everyone to tune in. So, again, welcome. I want to introduce Dr. Justin Shiner, uh, Texas A&M Horticulture Extensionist in Viticulture, actually. And I want to introduce Michael Cook, Viticulture Program Specialist for North Texas. That's right. So we're here today to talk to you about harvesting grapes in the backyard and making wine. So what, a, what an exciting time. It's been really hot lately. We were out in the vineyard yesterday filming, so we're going to go ahead and first teach you how to understand when your fruit, if you've got one grape in the backyard or a dozen, when is it time to harvest those grapes? That's one of the biggest questions we get. So we actually filmed out in the teaching and research vineyard about 10 minutes away from campus, and we're gonna have Dr. Helby, our colleague who's running the show here, um, play that clip, and then we're gonna come back and actually demonstrate making wine, which you can easily do in your garage or mudroom. Or living room. Living room, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> All right, so bear with us. If there are any technical difficulties and you lose connection, just go back to Aggie Horticulture's page and wait for the new live. I think it'll go smoothly, but you never know. So, and as Michael said earlier, if you're brewing grapes, we want to know uh, what you're growing. That's right. So let's give it a second. Hang tight. We're going to play the recorded video, and we'll be right back in my lab with work. Hey there, it's Thursday. We are here in the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Teaching, Research, and Extension Vineyard in the Brazos River Bottom. And we're gonna talk a little bit about harvesting grapes. Yeah, so one of the most common questions we get from homeowners and commercial growers is, when do I harvest my crop? When is it at its prime? And so we're gonna give you some tips and tricks. It's the dog days of summer, but the grapes here are ripe. Justin, tell us a little bit about this particular row before we give them some, some tips. Well, in this particular row, we're looking at a variety that was just named and released. It's called Kaminari Noir, and it's from the University of California Davis's breeding program. And it's a red wine grape that is tolerant to Pierce's disease. So this whole vineyard is a teaching and research vineyard. And what we do is we trial many different types of grapes. Right now we have about 30, maybe even 40 different varieties. And so, for example, this variety was trialed for quite a number of years here in Texas and elsewhere before it was officially released. So we've been following the progress of these grapes throughout the season from fruit set uh, when the berries were nice, hard and green. And now we're seeing they're full of color. They're starting to get ripe. And so we can really break down ripening into four different maturity um, indices. The first is what we call technological, aromatic, phenolic, and then what I like to call practical maturity. So a lot of y'all are growing a grapevine in the backyard maybe a dozen and uh, you notice the birds are coming in and stripping your fruit well you don't really have much choice you may not be able to wait as long as you'd like to and you have to harvest maybe you've got a party coming up you're going out of town so that one you really don't have much of a choice with another thing with uh, really practical maturity is when was the last time you sprayed a pesticide so we have to talk safety here before we we talk about other things and some of you may be putting out a pesticide that pesticide may be organic or conventional in nature but if it has a label registered with the environmental protection agency it's going to give you a phi a pre-harvest interval you want to check the label in your storage shed if you've applied anything uh, because that phi can range from zero days where you could spray that product whatever it is an insecticide a fungicide um, and you could harvest that day, zero day PHI, but it could have as much as a 66 day PHI in vineyards. So we wanna make sure that that PHI has passed and that we can actually get in and harvest our fruit. That's very important. So uh, we will be restricted if that PHI has not been satisfied. So that's the first thing we need to look at. But we've watched these grapes go from hard, green, bitter, sour, and now they're starting to color up. So Justin, let's talk about the first thing we can do in the backyard for testing if our grapes are ripe, and that's a technological feature. All right, so your grapes, as, as Michael said, they're gonna start off green and they're eventually going to change color. If they're white wine grapes, they're gonna become less green, more translucent. A lot of them will actually turn more yellow as they mature. Red wine grapes, the berries are gonna turn red and then eventually black for most varieties. And so typically, once we start to see that color change, it's still gonna be a few more, several more weeks 
before the grapes are fully mature. What happens during this process is the acidity in the grapes decreases. So that's the sourness, which if you think about wine, it's got some sourness in it. That's a good thing. And then the sugar increases. What does sugar mean? Sugar means alcohol. The higher the sugar, the higher the potential alcohol content. And the sugar rate uh, will increase and increase and increase, and eventually it'll plateau. And typically at that point, that's when the grapes are going to be uh, mature. Right. And so the first thing we can do in the backyard, besides tasting the fruit, we'll talk about in this in that in just a second, but quantitatively, we can measure the sugar. And there's an easy way to do that. Justin has provided his refractometer. This is a tool that's used in the fruit industry, even in vegetables with tomatoes. And this measures the sugar content of our fruit. And so we can start taking sugar samples once we enter veraison, which is the fancy French term for ripening. Uh, once we start seeing color, we can start monitoring the sugar and we'll see, like Justin said, it rise and then kind of plateau in the heat of the summer towards the end of the season. Uh, and so what we need to do is we need to take a number of berries and we're going to put that juice uh, onto the refractometer. This one's a, a handheld model. You can get them uh, online or at your homebrew, local homebrew supply store. Um, they're very inexpensive. And, and this uses the uh, principle of refraction. And so we're going to put a liquid on this glass here. We're going to hold it up to the sunlight and there's a scale. And based on the dissolved solids, the total soluble solids, namely sugar in this case, um, we're going to see the bending of illusion on this to where we see the, the bricks, we also call it bricks, B-R-I-X, or total soluble solids, will increase when there's more solids in the liquid that are dissolved. And so what we need to do is we need to take a representative sample. So we're out here in the vineyard and we're going to, if you have one vine, maybe take uh, a dozen berries or so, and you're going to take them from not just one part of the cluster, but try to randomize it. Uh, and we're going to take maybe one from the shoulder here, one from the center, maybe two, one from the bottom. But don't forget, there's also the back of the cluster, which is not getting as much sunlight exposure. And the numbers are going to be a little different, maybe a little more green. And so we want to pick one or two from that side. And of course, we don't have to pick the, the cluster when we do that. We can just pick berries off. But some people like to pick the whole cluster. Um, and so we need to sample appropriately. If you have one vine, maybe a dozen berries or so. If you have more than that, maybe 100 to 200 berries to get a representative sample. The last thing you want to do is work this whole time raising this beautiful crop and you take your refract, uh, your bricks reading and it says 24 and then you harvest and it's at 18 and you've missed your target, the fruit's harvested, and, and you might be in trouble depending on what you're gonna use it for. But let's go ahead and take some samples here. We're just gonna pick off our berries um, here. While he's doing that, he may not be able to do two things. I can't, I'm an Aggie, so. So let's talk about wild grapes and other fruit. So we're dealing with fresh grapes right here. Some people do have the luxury of using fresh grapes for wine making. You know, maybe you've got some vines in your backyard, Maybe you know one of the many commercial vineyards around the state of Texas and you can source fruit. There's some other ways uh, that you can get fruit as well. You can get it through home winemaking or, or brewing shops. They often have fresh fruit, uh, typically coming from the West Coast. You can actually use grape concentrate, just like the grape concentrate you buy at the store that you uh, reconstitute to make grape juice with. You can also use that for winemaking. And it's not just Concord. You can actually get Cabernet and all the known varieties. Uh, you can also get uh, frozen grapes, frozen juice. You can use practically any fruit for wine making as well. It gets a little more challenging uh, when you start using other fruits. And the reason is, is because grapes, they have the perfect ingredients and the perfect ratio for wine making. So you can literally make wine with zero additions in terms of maybe sugar additions or acid additions. Whereas if you're going to make wine, we'll say from blackberries, you're going to have to add sugar because they just don't have the same sugar content. And that's true for most fruits. So in that case, you're probably going to use a recipe. Right. So before we actually crush this and measure, I wanted to mention it, harvest is really simple. When you do make the decision to harvest, all you need is a food grade bucket uh, and some harvest nips. You can use scissors or, or pruning shears. But if you've got a lot of vines, those tend to be clunky and awkward to use and tiring. Um, you can actually purchase uh, snips for harvest. They're much smaller and lightweight and easier to get into a thick canopy. If you have children, you don't want them handling a blade. There are safety harvest. Um, what do you call those? Yeah. 
the grape razors um, where you can't cut yourself. So anyways, it's pretty simple, the equipment you need. Um, also talking about safety, um, it's hot. Make sure people are staying hydrated. Uh, we typically harvest, these are highly perishable, uh, these grapes when they're ripe. And so we're gonna harvest them in the early morning or late evening, not in the middle of the sun uh, and heat of the day. So we've got our grapes here in a Ziploc bag. We're gonna crush them up. Okay. And then we're gonna put a couple drops, not skin and seed, but just the liquid onto our reading glass. We're gonna that shut that. Very scientific. We're gonna, there we go, shut this, okay. And then we're going to make sure this is calibrated, uh, which we did. And then we're gonna put this into the sun and we're gonna see the gradient where it goes from white to blue. And that's gonna tell us the total soluble solids or the degree bricks reading, how much sugar is in this juice. So Dr. Shiner, what do you think the number is? Let's see, let's see. Okay. My, my random guess on this particular product is gonna be about 15. It's not ripe yet. It is actually at 18, 18% 18 total soluble solids or 18 degree bricks. We can, they're interchangeable. Um, so it is a little bit more, but not bad. When would we like to harvest this for wine use? What would be our target bricks? Well, one thing when you were holding that cluster up a minute ago, there was some green berries in there. So in that case, if we crushed all that fruit, green berries included, it's going to be less ripe. So we don't want any green berries if, if uh, you know, it's still ripening. This one we know is not done. Where we want to have it, in this particular case, is 22 to 24 degrees bricks. Uh, so we're looking at a potential alcohol content of around 12 to up to 14 percent is typically what we're working with. Yeah, what about jelly? So we have Lamanto. We're going to be demonstrating harvesting, uh, processing that in the winery in just a minute. But Justin won't mention this, but him and his wife make a mean jar of jelly. So if you're going to pick grapes for jelly use, what are you looking for there as far as ripeness? All right, so for jelly, we, we don't need as much sugar, right? Because often when we're making jelly and we're using sure gel or one of those types of pectins in there, you, you make a sugar addition. So if we were already at 22 degrees bricks, 22% sugar, if you made that sugar addition, the jelly is going to taste maybe disgusting and sweet. So we're looking at maybe even about half of that sugar. So 15% would be just fine. Or if you're used to making, you know, jelly from wild Mustang grape, our most common wild grape, that's typically in the 9 to 11% sugar ripeness when it's mature. Those wild grapes just don't accumulate the sugar. They have really high acid, which is why they taste so tart. And that turns out to be pretty good typically for jelly. So what you're saying is if you're going to harvest grapes for wine use, we're going to pick them at a different sugar level, maybe not as much acid or tartness compared to something for jelly. Is that right? Yeah, and if you're going to make jelly with something like a wine grape that's that's more ripe, we're probably going to look for that no sugar added uh, pectin. That's probably your best. Okay, so bricks or sugar content is something we're going to closely monitor. Anybody can do it in their backyard with a refractometer. There are two other things we can look at, the pH and the acidity. That's very difficult to do on a backyard scale, um, but we do look at it on a commercial scale. Um, it has to deal with the, the uh, you know, stability of wine, the ultimate stability and other things. But let's start talking about actually tasting this fruit. And so what we can do to kind of gauge the aromatic potential, the aromas that we're seeing in the fruit, a lot of those are locked up, but some may be expressing themselves depending on the variety. Um, and also the phenolic maturity, we can actually taste fruit, okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna clip a cluster uh, maybe once a week or so at the beginning, and then maybe a little bit more frequently. And we're gonna take a look at the fruit itself. So we can test the sugar, but we can actually taste the fruit. And this is more qualitative, but um, there's a couple things. We can look at the berry as a whole. Remember, they start off being very hard and green and sour and bitter and green tasting uh, and very, very bitter. Uh, but as they start to fill up with sugar, we start to see that dilution and the berry itself starts softening. So when you pull it off, you will notice it should pull off pretty easily. And the first thing is it should be pretty soft to the touch. We, we start seeing it getting a little more soft. We know that it's starting to ripen, okay? Um, we can also peel the skin, and if it peels well and we don't see a lot of the pulp clinging to the skin, it, it pulls off very nicely. Um, we know that it's starting to ripen pretty well. Uh, if we start rubbing our fingernail against the skin, we might even see in red grapes, the, the color start 
um, coming off of that. Uh, another thing is, another way to know if your grapes are starting to ripen is we can look at the pedicel. And the pedicel is just the little stem that connects each berry to the cluster. And if we pull that, we will see the brush, the vascular tissue. And if it's not ripe, we'll see a lot of the pulp adhering to that brush. But if we pull it and it stays clean, we know that the pulp is, um, is ripening, the, the berry's ripening pretty well. Okay, we'll see a lot of juice. The pulp will taste sweet, maybe just a little acidic, a little tart. And we can kind of gauge that every week. The, the seeds are edible. They're going to get crunchy brown as we move on. So you can crunch on those and taste that. Maybe taste like burnt toast in the morning. If you're like me, I usually burn my toast. But you'll start noticing that. And so there's some things you can do. Taste them. A lot of varieties have very unique um, tastes. Uh, they're aromatics. And so like uh, if you've ever had Moscato, the Muscat grape has that, that flavor and aromatic profile in the fruit. And so you'll start noticing that developing over time. So take a look at the fruit, take a look at the skin, the pulp, the seeds. You might also sing the peduncle, the stem on the cluster um, that connects to the shoot will start to lignify or turn brown. That's another indicator of ripeness. But these are easy things we can do um, to see if the fruit's ready. So, and if that is too complicated for you, then taste the fruit and next is measure the shoot. Measure the sugar and keep keep record. Uh, that's going to be really important, especially if you have more than one variety. Keeping record of the sugar content and your flavor, the taste that you get from the fruit. Speaking so, of that, let's look at some other varieties. Let's do. Let's do it. Come on. Go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We're here at the Lamanto. These are the grapes we harvested already. We're going to see those in the lab. Uh, remember Lamanto? We've talked about in previous episodes. It's one of my favorite backyard low maintenance grapes. Doesn't crop as heavy but the fruit is absolutely beautiful. Deep, deep, deep purple black fruit. Uh, one, of the, one of the fun things about this grape is it produces so much color. They're delicious. That it'll stain your tongue, it'll stain everything. So don't wear white when you're harvesting Lamanto. A lot of people don't wanna plant this under a pergola or arbor with concrete or tile because it can stain, but it has excellent color. One of my favorite jelly grape varieties and wine grape, but it makes great juice too. And so we take this berry, we put it in our mouth. We see that the skin melts. It's chewy, but it dissolves. It's, uh, the tannins are smooth, which are found in the skin. The color is very nice. It tastes nice and sweet, but a little acidity. Great for jelly. The pulp is nice and melting as well. The seeds are getting harder and crunchy, kind of toasty. So it's time to harvest these grapes. All right, so we also grow table grapes out here in our research vineyard. And so we're here in the Gulf Coast and growing table grapes in Texas can be a challenge, uh, especially in areas of the state where we get a lot of rain. This part of the state, we're not that far from the Gulf, so we have high humidity and we get a lot of gr rain during the growing season. So that can be a challenge as it relates to disease. So these grapes right here, this is an unreleased variety. It's a white table grape. It's got pretty good disease resistance, uh, but we, we do utilize a full disease management program here. So similar to the wine grapes, when we're talking about maturity of table grapes, you know, we can look at it, we see color change, we see the fruit get softer, feel the fruit get softer, uh, but ultimately table grapes, it's all about taste. So just pick berries off the cluster, taste them, and then you can decide when they're ripe. A really good variety, the Warrior Red, the grapes become edible, um, you know, not too long after they start to turn pinkish red in color. And if we don't have problems with lots of rain, they'll typically hold for even up to a month. So you can enjoy those grapes over a long period of time. This particular variety right here is seedless. It's got fairly small berries. And this is probably what you're going to see if you grow something like Thompson seedless. That's one of those grapes that you can find for sale all over the place. It's the number one uh, green table grape in the US. Uh, although it is losing popularity, uh, but it's not the best choice here in Texas. And if you buy this grape and you grow it and you do get fruit from your Thompson seedless, you're going to find out that it's quite small. It's not nearly as large as the fruit that you find in the grocery store. And the reason is because uh, synthetic hormones are applied to those table grapes uh, in commercial production. If you're going to pick one table grape uh, to simplify it, I would suggest that you look at Victoria Red. All right, so we also grow muscadine grapes out here in the research vineyard. Muscadine grapes are one of our native grapes. 
They're native to East Texas all the way up to Delaware, and they would rather be growing in a little further east in acid soil than they would here at this particular site. Our vineyard here is great farmland, but the pH of the soil is above seven. It's actually about 8.2, whereas the muscadine grape would rather be in the 5.5 to 6.5 range. And so a lot of people confuse this grape with the Mustang grape. They're two different native species. What's nice about the muscadine grape is that it has been improved through breeding and selection for about a hundred years now. And we have over a hundred different name varieties. And so one of the major differences between the wild muscadines and the domesticated muscadines is the wild muscadines are either male or female vines. So a male vine is only gonna produce viable pollen, never gonna produce any fruit. Female vine can produce fruit, but it has to be pollinated by a male somewhere in the vicinity. Grapes are primarily wind pollinated. Whereas a variety like this, this is Triumph. It's a bronze colored muscadine and it's self-fertile or perfect flowered. So you can only need one vine and it fertilizes itself and sets a nice crop. What's different about muscadines versus all of our other grapes is muscadines typically break bud or start to grow a little bit later during the season. It's a couple of weeks later than most of our bunch grapes and they ripen fairly late. So we're barely starting to see some grapes ripen now on these muscadine vines. We've got about 10 different varieties right here and they range in size from anywhere from about a large marble all the way up to almost the size of a ping pong ball. And if you come in and look at this particular variety, we can see a couple of berries in here. And what you'll notice is some of these are really small. This one is actually already starting to turn bronze. So how do you know when to pick a muscadine? Um, well, part of it is based off of taste and appearance. Muscadines also ripen often as an individual berry rather than a whole cluster. And those berries will actually pull off of the cluster very easily when they get ripe. In this case, you can see I'm tugging on this berry. It's not quite ripe, it's really close. Whereas these berries are still several weeks away. That's great for the backyard because we're gonna harvest these in a few days. We're gonna harvest these in several weeks so we can pick over a long period of time. So there are muscadine varieties out there that have been bred for winemaking and fresh eating. And recently we have some seedless muscadines, which is pretty exciting. So if you live in the Eastern part of the state, you've got acidic soil, muscadines are a nice option, super disease resistance, uh, excellent flavor, although it's quite different than most table grapes. Um, and they can be quite productive. All right, guys, so that was a little bit out in the vineyard. Tips and tricks on when to harvest. Let's see what we like. Oh, oh. Okay, hang on, okay, hang on. Get our Lamanto fruit and another white wine cultivar that's ready to go. So the first thing I want to talk about is, Justin, when you pick these fruit, where do you take them? And can you store them or do you have to process them immediately if you don't have time to make wine right away? You take them to my house. Take them to your house. Um, so whenever you harvest your grapes, typically we want to harvest them in the cool part of the day, this time of the year, you know, that's early morning. From there, you can hold on to them up, up to about two weeks in cold storage, but really if you can process them right away, that's your best bet. So we have some red wine grapes here uh, down. Maybe we can, we can have a look. This is Lamato, and we also have some white wine grapes. And so what we want to do is walk you through the winemaking process step by step. We're going to keep it very simple today. We know that some of you have to get back to work before you get caught by your boss on Facebook. So we're just going to walk you through the individual steps, and what we may end up doing is having a, a series where we focus on uh, individual steps, because you can keep it really simple in your winemaking, and you can make it as complicated as you want. The first thing I'll say is that if you're making wine for the first time, and you want to do it, go to a homebrew workshop, a, a store, winemaking store. You can find them in, in medium-sized, large cities, or you can get it online. We get a winemaking kit. It's going to have all the things you need to get started, and it's going to have a recipe. And usually, those recipes, you know, are, are, are designed for success. The wine quality may not be outstanding, but it gives you a good opportunity to get a feel for it. 
What you'll also notice in those kits is one of the most important things, and that is a cleaning agent and a sanitizing agent. The most common reason why wine fails at home is because you didn't clean everything. Think of you're being in a hospital with coronavirus. Everything has to be spot free, not only clean, but also sanitized. Every utensil, every bucket has to be clean. Let me ask you this, Mike. We're talking about cleaning and wine and the importance of it. When do the grapes get washed? They don't. I don't wash my grapes. Do you wash your grapes? They don't need any fresh out of them. They don't. Grapes, grapes don't get washed. That's a common question people have uh, about wine making. You know, it's not feasible, it's not practical, and it's really not necessary. What Michael's talking about is your equipment. That's right. So you can bring in bacteria and things like that that aren't necessarily going to hurt you, but can spoil your wine. So what you want to do is, between each batch of wine, is make sure your equipment is uh, sanitized. There's different sanitizers you can use. You can just use dish soap and water. That's perfect. So let's walk through the steps very quickly and show them how we're going to make wine. So we've got our fruit here. The first thing we need to do, if you've had a lot of people harvest, is remove the MOG, the M-O-G, material other than grapes, leaves and stems and maybe an insect or two that got in there, maybe someone's glove. Pick off all the, uh, the green leaves. That's going to add some negative qualities to the wine. So clean up your fruit, remove anything that's unripe. There and is no MOG in here, by we, the way. We did a great job. Fran Pontash harvested this. She did fabulous. So. Let's take this. The first thing we have to do with these grapes is... All right, so it depends on what kind of wine we're going to make. But in general, normally what you do is you take the berries away from the stems. Right? You need to do this by hand. Stream some Netflix, put on some Murder, She Wrote, or your favorite series. Stomp. And uh, it's kind of like shelling peas. It's going to take a while to get it done. If you have kids or grandkids, that's even better. Or if you get serious into this, you know how some people get their hobbies very serious, you could actually buy a crusher de stimmer. So this is what's used commercially. Uh, this is a scaled down version. It's not as fancy as what you would see necessarily in a larger winery. Uh, but this does all the work for you very quickly. So this particular machine is rated up to a ton to a few tons of grapes an hour. So we'll show you just how quick this is right here. He's gonna de stim and crush about 20 pounds of grapes. And Rachel, do you wanna come into the top hopper here and we can see what happens? Okay, so we're going to turn this on. grapes, juice, and skin. So we could take this juice and we can make jelly if we wanted to. Um, but in our case, we're going to make wine. So this is a red wine grape. The juice of this grape, Lamanto, is actually already red. Most red wine grapes, it's clear, and we actually get the color from the skins. And so what we do is we leave the skins and the seeds in with the juice during the whole winemaking process, and that's where the color comes from. All right, so let's look at white wine. So we'll move over here. So if you're making a white wine, you don't have the color in the skins, and you don't need the skin to turn the wine making process. You don't need the skin. So all we want here is the juice. So you can press the juice out. This is where the I Love Lucy episode comes into play, or your Stomping the grapes, trying to get the juice out. You can try that. It's not as much fun as it looks. Uh, or you can use something like this. This is a little press. I think we probably got off of Amazon. You can typically get these 100 to a few hundred dollars. This one's pretty simple. All we're doing is this steel plate is pushing down on the grapes. The juice is coming out of the holes, and we're catching it. You can do this by hand as well. So if you're doing this on a small scale, you can use something like cheesecloth or some sort of strainer or colander, and you squeeze the juice out. What's nice about these little machines like this is we can pretty efficiently squeeze the juice out 
and get really high juice yields. So we don't waste very much in terms of fruit. So while Michael is uh, working away in here, breaking a sweat, I will tell you that if you get ready to make wine, I don't think you need to press all the juice out, but this gives everybody an idea. So we're going to capture some of this juice because we want to measure the sugar in it. Okay. So if you're interested in making wine and you're trying to figure out, you know, how much fruit do I need? If we're talking about grapes, typically it's about 15 pounds of fruit per gallon. So about three pounds or so per bottle uh, in, order, in order to make wine. So you can do some planning that way. If you're using other types of fruit, it's going to be dependent on, on what specific fruit counts of juice you're actually going to get out of that. But you can find that type of information on the internet. So what is the smallest batch of wine you can make? You can make wine on the gallon level. You can make wine even on the half gallon level. And remember, okay. a gallon is about four to five bottles, depending on how many times you taste test that throughout the winemaking process. That's right. All right, so now that we have our juice, why don't tell them what you're going to do with the... So this is that refractometer. We're measuring the sugar, and it was at 15 degree bricks, or 15% total soluble solids. So that may not be enough to make a nice, crisp wine, maybe not as heavy, not as much alcohol at the end. So um, we want to measure our sugar out in the field to know when to harvest, but we also want to measure it once we've crushed and destemmed everything. We've got the whole back, so we know exactly what we're working with, and if we need to capitalize. So, you want to talk about capitalization, Justin? Sure. So, uh, wine ranges in alcohol content from 7 to 24 percent. But really, when you go to the grocery store and you buy table wine, most of it's going to be in the 10 to 15 percent range, a uh, very large majority of it. So, if you're trying to figure out how much alcohol this juice is going to produce, it's pretty simple. You measure the sugar, whether you use a hydrometer like this or a refractometer, you multiply that number times 0.55. And that's going to be your alcohol yield estimate. So if you wanted more alcohol, you add more sugar. And uh, you know, rather than doing the calculation, there's lots of tables online where you can figure out what these are types of additions you want to make. Okay, so what do we do from here? Now we've got our juice. Now that we have our red wine grapes over here crushed and destemmed, we refer to that as a must as we're in the industry. We've taken our beginning sugar reading with the hydrometer or with our refractometer to know where we start. We're going to track that throughout the process to know when it's finished. We need to pitch some yeast. All right, what does that mean? So we have some yeast here. There are many different types of yeast. You can get pretty wild. Uh, these are not wild strains of yeast. These have been uh, selected through uh, companies, through research, and that may express or be better used for certain types of wines. Better different flavor profiles, maybe something you've used one yeast for this white wine that would provide more citrus notes uh, or ones more tropical. So the yeast actually, when it's making ethanol by consuming the sugar in this uh, must, it also is doing a lot of unlocking potential um, aromatics that we can smell and other, other things. So yeast is really important. The question is, can you go to their box store, your grocery store, and pick up some bread yeast? Yeah. Is that ideal? Well, it depends on your circumstances. It may be in this case. Um, so the yeast that we're using, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the species. That's the same stuff you use for bread. And the reason it makes bread dough rise is because yeast is producing carbon dioxide, just like you breathe out, when it ferments the sugars. So it eats the sugars in your dough, eats the sugars in your juice, gives off carbon dioxide, your dough rises. Or in the case for wine, we actually have a fermentation that we started yesterday. We can take a look, and you can see that the CO2 that's been produced, why don't you stick your hand in there, Michael, and I will show them that CO2. You can see here, it's floated all up the bubbles. All the skins. So that's how we know fermentation You can is see the starting. bubbles in the juice, too. So see. fermentation has started. We, we started this yesterday to show y'all, but we would take our, our must here of Lamanto and we would pitch our yeast. But it's really important to make sure you take care of those yeast because they're not, they're, they're essentially asleep. And so we have to prepare that yeast. You want to show let's, them how? Let's keep it simple. Keep it simple. Read the directions on the packet there you go. or go online. We're, we're, trying, we're going to try to keep this short for you. And it's going to tell you how to make a yeast starter. It's just like for your bread. If it's too hot, you're going to kill the yeast. If it's too cold, you might actually kill the yeast as well, or they're not going to be as active. So once you have your juice for white wine, your must for red wine, or maybe you're going to make honey mead, you take your honey, you add water in there. Usually it's about a one to three uh, 
uh, for honey, but you'll have some recipe probably. Then at that point, you'll add your yeast to it. And now, fermentation will start. So what kind of container do we need to make wine? Or what kind of containers? For fermentation? Yeah. I would say a food grade pail here is, is adequate. Yes. Depending on the size of your batch, either a two gallon or one and a half gallon, maybe a five gallon. Okay. Or this, maybe a trash can. So we're making red wine here, and there's a difference. So we have the skins and the seeds, and what's going to happen is during fermentation, these are going to float up, and it's going to cover the juice. And it's going to prevent it from coming in much contact with air. So we can simply put it in a bucket like this on a larger scale in a winery. This is essentially a large stainless bucket. Same sort of thing. These types of tanks can be very, very large in commercial winemaking. This is perfect for red wine tanks. And the reason is because as those skins float up, every day we're going to come in here and we're going to mix this up because we want our skins and seeds in contact with juice because that's where the color comes from. That's where a lot of those flavors are. If you're making white wine, we will actually put the juice into some sort of sealed container that's easier to seal like this. This is a glass carboy. You can get these in plastic as well. Plastic tends to scratch a little easier. It's a little more difficult to clean. This is a five gallon, you can get six gallons, you can get three gallons, one gallon, half gallons. If you wanna keep it simple and you're making wine, you can just have two of these in two different sizes. The reason I say you need two is because after the fermentation starts and finishes, you're done, you officially have wine, you're gonna have a bunch of stuff in the bottom that's gonna settle out. This is gonna be yeast, this is gonna be little bits and pieces of grapes, and you wanna get your wine away from that. The way that we do that is we siphon it. We call it racking, but you're essentially just using a hose, just like you're stealing gas, like that's used right. to back in your young days, cook. And uh, you would stick the hose in here, you would try to keep it above the solids, you would start a suction, and then you would siphon off that juice. So what that means is, instead of having a full container, now you're going to have some headspace. Once you have wine, you don't want that. So you need a couple of different sizes of containers to make wine. So what you're saying is, after fermentation is complete, we don't want oxygen in our vessel. That's right. That's right. And how do you prevent that from happening? Well, there are little stoppers like this. This is called an airlock. This is about a dollar. Go to your winemaking shop. It's basically, it operates on the same principle as a P-trap under your sink, where you have water in here. It prevents air from going down in, but if pressure builds from below, it will allow bubbles to escape. There's a couple of different designs. This one actually looks more like a P-trap right here. Um, and then you have a stopper that it fits in. Each of these are about a dollar. This glass carboy is going to be, this one's probably going to be in the range of $28. This one's going to be around $32, $35. So you do spend some money to get started, but you're going to be able to use these for years unless you're clumsy and you, uh, you break them. All right, so we walked you through a couple of steps. Extract your juice. You're going to measure the sugar. You may need to add, you may not. You're going to add your yeast. Fermentation begins. You should see signs of it by the next day. The next day you ought to see something happening. And if you do this at room temperature, then it's probably going to finish in somewhere about a week's time. Sometimes as fast as three days. How do you know when it's finished? You'll stop seeing the bubbles. Those skins and seeds that were floating up, they won't float up anymore. And the best part is, you taste the entire time. Right. And you're going to know it's finished because it's not going to taste sweet at all. We'll call that dry. That just means there's no sweetness left. At that point, we said we want to protect it from air. Yes. We're going to siphon away the wine. It's officially wine at that point. We call that racking. These are the leaves, the solids. We rack away from that. Typically, it's going to settle over a week to a month again. You're going to have some more leaves. We call those fine leaves. It's mostly just yeast at that point. It'll settle out one more time. We'll rack it again. And you may have to do this a couple of times to get your wine nice and clear. And then from there, you'll taste it. And if you're satisfied with the final product, you can go straight to bottle. And there are a lot of additives and things you can do if you want to get fancy and make a different style of wine. To keep it simple, you can go straight from here to a bottle. And you can do that in a pretty short period of time. And those wine kits will provide some fighting agents you can mess with and play around with. And some chips. 
But it's finding. We, that, that's, we don't have time. Maybe in another episode we'll talk nitty gritty on finding. Okay. But the point is, is it can get complicated or you can, you can keep it simple. Quick start with the kids. Start with the kids. kids. You can right. make some really nice wine. If you want to experiment, there are other things like oak. You can buy little oak barrels just like a winery. You can use oak chips. There are some other additives as well that you can add uh, to make your wine uh, style different, maybe more to your liking. Okay, so what do we do when we know our wine's ready and we're ready to bottle it? What's the process there? Okay, so we missed a critical step. We did. You can do this at the beginning, and if you look at a recipe, it's going to tell you, you need to do this right after you press the juice out. And that is, you're going to add a preservative, this is not it, this is it, potassium metabisulfite. Okay, you can get it in a tablet form, or you can get it in a powder form. And so like these little tablets in your recipe, it'll say add one tablet to your five gallon carboy. It'll probably tell you to do it twice. So this as a preservative, it has antimicrobial properties, specifically bacteria that'll spoil your wine. And it's an antioxidant. It'll keep your white wine from turning brown. It'll keep your red wine from turning brown. Some people are concerned about adding sulfites. And what I'll tell you is if you look at a bottle of wine and you turn it around, it's gonna say contain sulfites. Uh, unless it is an organic wine, which is fairly rare. Uh, so it's very commonly used in, in winemaking. And if you're very concerned about it, then you probably don't want to eat any dry fruit. Dry fruit. So dried apricots, for example, have a lot of sulfites. So do typically vegetables or fruits that are cut up in package. So it's pretty common. Your favorite. Your favorite. Exactly. Reasons. So before bottling, typically you'll add uh, metabisulfite. And then you can either buy wine bottles like this from the home brew shop. Or, if you already drink wine, you can save your own wine bottles. It's tricky to get the label and the glue off. Certain types of labels are easy, some are more difficult. It's up to you. I bet if you start making wine, you're probably not going to save bottles because fiddling with those labels is kind of a pain. And even if they're new bottles, you're going to want to clean and sanitize those before you put your precious wine that you worked so hard on and make sure it's clean. So you'll take your wine, you'll go back to your hose. There are different uh, little, little tools that can help out with bottling. You fill your bottle. This is a floor corker. There are actually hand corkers that are about $15 to $20. This one's more like $75. So of course you can spend as much money as you want. They both work on the same principle in that you can buy cork of various sizes and types. And what this does is it compresses the cork and then forces it down into the neck of the bottle, just like so. Okay, now you have a somewhat professional looking bottle of wine. One thing is missing, that is a capsule. There are various types and colors of capsules. You can also buy labels. You can of course print your own as well and make a fairly professional looking product. These are perfect for gifts. So how much money do we have in, in it right now if we were gonna make one from a kit in time for Christmas presents? Maybe yes, about one month, of, one month of your salary. So about $200 maybe? Uh -huh. Yeah, about $100, $200 you can get a winemaking kit. Typically you'll make 20 to 25 bottles. And so if you do the math, it's actually not that expensive. This may not be the best wine in the world, uh, but it's a good start, it's a good way to get started. If you wanna just try your first wines, keep it simple. Try something fruity and probably sweet in my opinion, yes. um, so that you're more likely to be successful. And don't let that wine age for three years. The wines um, that we make at home are, need to be consumed within typically one to two years. So don't let it sit, enjoy it. There's nothing quite like growing your own crop and making your own wine and sharing that with friends over dinner. I'm gonna say three to six months, you should be able to have a white wine that's, that's palatable, drinkable. Yeah. Six months to a year on a red wine. What's gonna happen is you're gonna to wanna to taste it the whole way. Right? Make sure and save at least a bottle or two so that a year from the time you started, maybe even a year and a half, you can go back because wine usually mellows out and smooths out, and in many cases tastes better. And while we can make the wine from these grapes in the garage or in a mud room, we don't wanna actually be aging our wine in the garage that's not air conditioned. So make sure that's in a dark, cool closet. All right, I think uh, we've probably taken enough time. Everybody needs to get back to work. Well, we appreciate y'all for tuning in. I think uh, we're going to do some more segments later on and kind of go into more detail, but this might give you just enough to go ahead and order that wine kit and play around with the grapes that you've grown. 
And I want to thank our specialists who have been on the line answering questions. Um, our filmer here, Rachel Sampson and Susan Webb, um, doing all the legwork, making sure this goes smoothly. And our very own colleague, Dr. Peter Hillowey, uh, thank you all so much. And until next time, I know next Wednesday we have another Aggie Horticulture Live segment. That's what's going on, Dr. Shiner. Yeah, tell us what you want to hear about. All right, thanks, guys.